Okay, so welcome again. Now we're going to look at collective action problems through a formal lens that is giving it a for formalizing the problem in a way that we can hopefully better understand it and also better understand how to possibly solve the problem. And the theory we're going to use to formalize it is called rational choice theory. It's a theory that has two main roles. On the one hand, a descriptive, and the other hand, a prescriptive or normative role. So on the descriptive side, it tries to explain or predict the behavior of rational agents. So it tries to explain the behavior of agents who act rationally. The prescriptive side is tries to identify the action that such an ideally rational agent should take. What should they do? What ought they to do? Um, so this rational choice theory does try to, is often used in economics by assuming that we are at least approximately rational agents and then tries to explain what people would do when they, for example, buy products. Um, but it also can be used as a theory about what one should do if one would be rational. So it's a theory of rationality. Now, when it talks about rationality here, it's important to remember, and we've already been into this a little bit, uh, the difference between theoretical and, rash and, and practical rationality. So I like this example to illustrate that, and uh, I haven't used it, so I've sort of used this. Um, so, you know, suppose you're running in a race in this, uh, well, so suppose in, you're, you're this uh, woman in, in um, not the woman in, in red, but the woman in blue. Um, and then you think, uh, you ask yourself, should I believe that I can win the race, still win? Um, and so I'm illustrating this difference between theoretical and practical rationality. This, this belief might be rational in one way and not in a different way. I mean, it's rational in the practical sense. That is, you might think that if I, very, if I just believe very strongly that I can win, I'm more likely to win. So I can use this um, belief as a tool to win the race. So practically it's rational, but I was not theoretically rational because I know that I'm probably, uh, that in the past I have not been very successful at this. I know that I've you know, had sleeping problems lately and I'm not in very good shape. I haven't been training. So I don't have very evident, good evidence that I can win. Okay. So this difference between theoretical practical rationality is something that um, you will remember from our debate about Clifford and James, where Clifford thought the, when it comes to belief, the only things that are relevant is what evidence we have. So it's only theoretical rationality that is relevant when it comes to belief, um, where James thought that sometimes we can choose beliefs on practical rational grounds. Okay. So previously we talked a lot about how we should form beliefs and what role practical reasons, are, if any, play in the form of beliefs and theory choices and science and so on. So now we're going to really just look at practical rationality. We're just concerned with the question, what are the rational actions, okay? <clears throat> so what makes an action rational? One um, aspect of practical rationality is called instrumental rationality, and that's uh, the rationality that we have, we take the means or to our goals. We take the instruments where to achieve the goals. So if, for example, you have the goal to get a good grade in this class, then you are, um, might take the means to do that if you're rational. And you might say that someone isn't rational if they have that goal, but they don't do what's necessary to get there. I mean, they know that they need to study or they know that they need to attend. Um, they, 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 they should uh, in, you know, do the exercise on canvas and so on, um, but they don't do that even though they do have the goal. So then they're irrational, that instrumental rationality sense. 
Um, now, the notion of instrumental rationality is important, uh, but it doesn't tell us what to do uh, when we're faced with uncertainty. So I'm going to talk about this. What uncertainty is, a case when we don't quite know yet what the outcome of um, it uh, will be, but that is what the result of our actions will be. Okay. So there's one general theory then of rational actions that takes that, um, e that degree of uncertainty into account and that's the, um, the expected utility theory. Um, so according to the expected utility theory, an action is rational when it maximizes expected utility. Um, so here, so rationality is defined in terms of choosing an outcome that's expected to be the best outcome according to your own preferences. Okay. So you, we, we're not evaluating which preferences you have. We just have some preferences, some things you want, and we just say that what you should do is to take the means to get what you want, given the chances of actually getting that. Okay. Okay. So here's one way to illustrate the uncertainty aspect of this. Um, suppose that some tells you can choose between these two things. Either uh, I pay you one thousand kronas. I'm having this dice, and I'm going to roll the dice, um, and uh, I pay you one thousand kronas. If you get a one, or you can also choose to get 300 kronas um, if you, if it's any of these other numbers. Uh, sorry, uh, to, you have to pay 300 kronas if any of these other numbers come up. Okay? So, on the one hand, you might think, well, choosing the one is better because you get out of a thousand um, choosing the others. Uh, but, but then the, the, the issue here is if you then you can calculate um, what is what, what you expect. So in one six of the cases, because it's six sides on the dice, in one six of the cases, you will get 1,000. In, in five six of these cases, you have to pay 300. So then you calculate, well, there's one in six chance of getting 1,000, then there's five and six chance of having to pay, pay 300, so minus 300. So then calculate this as just minus 83.3. Um, so the expected utility of that is negative. Okay, so you have, uh, in this case, um, a negative, the, 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 it's probable that you have to pay. You might be lucky, but um, if the numbers are slightly different, you pay less than the expected utility. In this case, it's neutral. So then, if you ask, well, is that is that a game you want to play? You should say, well, it doesn't matter to me. Okay. So this is just to illustrate this expected utility theory. So you should do the things that um, achieve what you want. Um, given the probabilities that those things are actually happening. Okay, so here, the probabilities are evident with regard to dice. In other cases, of course, it's getting, we have less knowledge about what the probabilities are. Okay, so expected utility theory, then it's a theory for what is individually practically rational. Um, Ideally rational agents will be agents that maximize expected utility. Um, note that this theory takes an agent's choices isolated and independent of the choices of others. So you have just individual agents, they are making choices um, and you're not thinking directly about others. They're just faced with various options that have various possible outcomes that will either um, lead to the things the agent wants, satisfies their preferences, or lead to things the agent doesn't want, um, it will lead to negative um, outcomes. <clears throat> um, 
Now, note that in this, in all of this, um, we're not, we're thinking just about individual rationality. We're not at this point thinking about agents' um, um, moral concerns, although they might have moral preferences too. They might have the preference to be a nice person. And then that will just be another preference that would figure into their rational, the, the assessment of their rationality. Okay, now we're going to game theory. Okay, so in, in the case of rational choice theory, we're just looking at individual agents. In the case of game theory, we're looking at the strategic interaction between rational individuals. We'll call these individuals players. Okay, so that's going to be players and they are playing with each other. Um, and so here, an indivi a rational individual will always and should always act so as to maximize expected utility given her expectations about behavior of the other player. Okay. So here's the, you're not just trying to maximize expected utility, you maximize the expected utility given that you have certain expectations about what the others can do. Um, so someone who is a player in such a game will often use best reply reasoning. So that means the following. Um, the individual will choose an action that is the best response to the action that she anticipates the other person will choose. So I anticipate that you will do a certain thing. And then I think, well, what should I do given that you do that? Well, okay, so you have two things you can do. I think you can do this, and then I will do this action. Or you can do that other thing, then I will do that thing. So you choose the best reply to the possible actions that your uh, the other player can choose. Okay, so we're going to illustrate this with the most famous kind of game <coughs> that's been studied in game theory, and that's the prisoner's dilemma. Um, and this is for almost the rest of the lecture. The, today we'll look at the prisoner's dilemma. Okay, so we're going to illustrate the prisoner's dilemma with two characters, Tony and that's Griselda. Uh, Tony and Griselda have committed a crime together. Unfortunately, they have been caught uh, in a crime. I mean, so you know, they have robbed the bank. Um, let's say it hasn't been so bad. It's been a bad bank anyway, but so they, they we shouldn't think about, it's not immoral. It wasn't a very immoral thing. They just robbed the bank. It's it's like in a, in a, in a, you know, in a mafia, in a movie. They are, they, we don't think about them as their moral character. We're just thinking, these are these poor uh, criminals that have been trying to do some cool kind of um, um, stealing the money from the bank in some very cool way. Um, anyway, but they have been caught by the police and now the police has them. Um, and now the police has put them in two different, different um, cells um, completely isolated from each other. They can't talk to each other. Uh, each of them is talking to a policeman. Okay. Um, now the police says to them, and let's assume that's right, that they have enough evidence to convict them for a minor crime. Okay, some minor thing that they have said. Okay, Tony, we know that um, you have um, broken into the bank. So you have been, you've been a part of this. So the minor crime, we know. Right? Um, but we don't, the police doesn't really have enough evidence to convict them of this major crime. Okay. Now, the police give them two options. Okay. We, we, now they have, Tony and Griselda have the following two options. The police tells them that if they testify against the other, so they say, if they testify that the other uh, was involved. Okay. So Tony says, yeah, Griselda, I know I've seen her. She is a part of it. Then um, they get a sentence reduction of one year. Okay. So they, the sentence, the prison sentence will be reduced by one year. Um, okay. So now these Tony and Griselda in the separate cells have sort of two options. On the one hand, they can do defect, okay, so it's, it's a second of these. So where they testify against the other, 
So Tess Fatoni says, Griselda, yeah, she was involved, get a sentence reduction of one year. While the partner, of course, they will know that, Griselda gets convicted for both the minor crime, two years, uh, one year, and the major crime, so three years. So Griselda, in this, if, if, if Tony defects, so if he testifies against Griselda, then Griselda will get three years, and Tony, um, and, and, and he gets a reduction of one year. Or it can cooperate where they don't testify against the other and they get a sentence. Um, then they get just this one year for the minor crime. Okay, so we can also cooperate. Okay, so now we look at this from the strategic point of view, what the options are. And that's often put in a so called payoff matrix. Okay, so it's important to try to understand this kind of matrix. We'll, but because that is really helping to understand these collective action problems. <laughs> so we're trying to, to use this in, this in this simplified example. Okay, so we'll have the uh, um, a four, uh, a two by two matrix where um, there's these two characters, Tony on one side, Griselda on, so Tony, um, as it were, has Tony's actions on the two columns, uh, two, Rose and Griselda's actions are described into two columns. Okay, so Tony can cooperate or defect, cooperate or defect, and Griselda can cooperate or defect. Okay, now let's look at um, the, the now we write down the numbers. In numbers, we write down the number of years in prison they have to serve. Okay, and uh, the blue numbers correspond to Griselda, the green numbers correspond to Tony. So let's say if both uh, if both cooperate, right, then they can be only convicted of the minor crime, so they get one year in prison. So we try to write one year because they take one year from their life, okay, minus one. So one year in prison. So if they both cooperate, they get both of minus one. Okay, so that's why the this uh, cell of this matrix is minus one, minus one. Okay. Um, now if Tony cooperates and Griselda defects. Then Tony gets convicted of the minor crime and the major crime, so three years in prison, whereas Griselda will get a reduction from, she will not be uh, convicted of the major crime because Tony didn't said that she wasn't a part of it. Um, and so she will be um, serving nothing. She will uh, walk free because she uh, gets one year reduction uh, for that minor crime. And so that was minus one, so you get to zero. Okay, so three years in prison for Tony, zero for Griselda. Now, if Tony defects, on the other hand, so if he testifies against Griselda, then um, if Griselda um, is cooperating, then Tony walks free because well, Griselda says that Tony wasn't a part of it. Um, Tony testifies against Griselda and so gets a reward of one year reduction. And so he's only, he only have the minor crime against him. So he will get nothing. Um, Griselda, by the other hand, she is now convicted of both the major crime and the minor crime. So she gets three years in prison. Now, what if Tony defects and Griselda also defects? Well, in that case, um, um, they both, um, so in that case, um, um, they both testify against the other. So they get uh, both a reduction of one year, but they both also both get, um, they both get convicted for the major crime. And so they both get two years in prison. Okay, so it's minus two and minus two. Okay. Good, okay. So this is illustrating the matrix is what are the possible outcomes? So this collects all contains all the possible outcomes. Tony can cooperate or defect, Griselda can cooperate or defect, and then there's the number of years in prison that will result of that from that. Okay. Generally, um, what we have in this payoff matrix that are used in game theory are actions by the different players. Play A, play B. There can also be more than one player, uh, more than two players. Then the thing gets much more complicated, and it's a very hard. So it starts very different quickly. It starts to be the drawing of these so be extremely difficult, um, and these numbers are going to represent utilities. So um, how 
good is it for the player? And we've used negative numbers in the other case here uh, because your total Cs were negative. So we, we wanted to say, well, it's negative because you want to curse them. So in other cases, it might be positive. They get money for it or they get something that they want. Okay. <clears throat> now we're going to look at uh, trying to understand this sort of uh, action in the prisoner's dilemma case. Okay. So let's think about this from Tony's perspective. So he can think now, okay, so what should I do? Should I cooperate or should I defend? So he can think, okay, so let's think about the case of uh, where Griselda cooperates, okay? So let's assume that she cooperates. If you assume that Griselda, if, she, if Tony says, okay, if, if she cooperates, then either I cooperate or defect, but, but then if I cooperate, I get, one year in prison. If I defect, I get nothing because I have testified against her. So evidently, if I co if if Griselda cooperates, I should defect um, because then I get um, then I get um, the um, the in the walk free. So that's better. Okay. So if she cooperates, I should defect. Now I think, what is the other option? The Griselda also defects. Okay. So if she also defects, then it would also be better to defect because two years in prison is better than three years in prison. So, because if I cooperate while she defects, I get three years in prison, while if I also defect, I get two years in prison. So whatever Griselda does, it's from Tony's perspective, it's better to defect. And this is then in game theory called a dominant strategy for Tony. So it's a strategy that's better whatever the other player does, it dominates uh, the cooperating strategy. Whatever the other player does, it's better to defect. So defect dominates cooperation. It's the thing that's better no matter what the other side does. Now let's look at this from Griselda's perspective. It's of course entirely asymmetric. Um, so if Tony, now you think if Tony cooperates well, then defect is better than cooperate because it is better to get nothing as so we can walk free than to get one year in prison. But if Tony defects, then it should still defect because then if I, because if I cooperate, then I get three years in prison, whereas if I defect, I get only two years in prison. So whatever the other person does, it's better to defect. And again, defect is also a dominant strategy for Griselda. Okay. So since both Tony and Griselda, they should rationally clearly defect. And so we would end up in um, this corner, the defect defect corner. Uh, and that is uh, called a Nash equilibrium of this game um, after the mathematician Nash. It's a, in kind of really invented game theory. He wrote a doctoral dissertation that I think was about 30 pages long, really, really short. And he invented game theory in the 50s, I think. He's famous, some of you might have seen this movie about him. He uh, was an interesting character. Um, a Nash equilibrium then is a <clears throat> option where no player can do any better by unilaterally changing their strategy. So this defect effect is an outcome where neither Griselda nor Tony can improve their outcome by changing their strategy. That is by changing what they do. They can't improve on that at all. They, I mean, um, so that's, that's why this is a Nash equilibrium. Okay, so now why is this called a dilemma? It's because the result is that if both you both choose your optimal strategies, you both defect and end with three, oh, sorry, two years, it should be two years, I'm sorry, um, two years in prison. But notice that had you both cooperated, you'd, ended, you'd have ended up with only one year in prison, okay? So if you both cooperate, <laughs> would end up with only one year in prison. But the Nash equilibrium is that we both end up with, we, we both end up with two years in prison. So we end up with something that's completely rational, that's 
suboptimal um, from uh, in the outcome. So we will end up in a situation where both go to prison for two years, even though they could have gone only both to prison only for one year um, if they just both had not defected. That is, has had they had not told them. So note that this is this. We're just assuming that they're only interested in their what's good for them, and despite the fact that they're only interested in what's good for them, they're not getting what's good for them, but just following what's rational um, in this rational choice sense that they're, they're trying to maximize their expected utility. They're trying to maximize their expected utility, but they're ending up in a scenario where they're not, in fact, getting the best outcome. Okay, now, how is this connected to collective action problems? It's because what's best for Tony and Criselda collectively cooperate. For them, it's collectively, it would be better to cooperate. That would be the minimal number, if you add up the numbers, <laughs> the minimal number that they together can have, so one minus one plus minus one, that's a minimum of just two. That's a lot smaller than four. They end up with the worst outcome collectively. <laughs> So what individually, what collectively would be, be the best thing would be both cooperate. But what's individually rational isn't that. In, what's individually best for them is to defect. So Tony and Grisella together would do best if both contributed to that collective action where they both said, well, we're not talking about any of these uh, things. But each of them has an incentive not to contribute to that because whatever the other version does, it's best for them to defect. Okay. So this is how this illustrates, sorry, this is how this illustrates the prisoner's dilemma, collective action problems, and gives us with this game theoretic tools, a, um, a, a sort of um, formal, formalism to understand it. And indeed now you can try to, for example, um, play with these numbers and say, well, how would this change if the numbers were different than this? Um, we can look at exactly how you would change, have to change the numbers to get a different outcome. So that defect effect, for example, is not anymore a um, Nash equilibrium. We can also study, for example, we can program computer to play these um, um, games. And we see what happens if they play them again and again and again and again and again. What would uh, what would happen over time, um, and so on and so forth. So this is why this is such an interesting tool to study collective action problems because it gives us mathematical formalism to understand. Okay. In the next um, part, we'll then talk uh, more about the tragedy of the commons and how that that article by Hardin and the term, the tragedy of the commons that he really has invented more or less, um, how that fits into this collective action problem.